I, I enjoy this day, and just so you're not worried up front, I don't have a lot to say. I only have a little bit. They wrote in the worship order a certain amount of time that I should use, and I'll try and do that. So, uh, but I, I get excited. Uh, you guys can take a breath. You're done with that part. They did a great job, didn't they, presenting? I, I pointed out to them probably, even though you knew it was coming, one of the things you didn't want to do when you woke up this morning was probably public speaking. Uh, as most of us don't actually uh, desire to do that, it's just the weird ones that do. I enjoy it. Um, it it's really fun. I want to just focus, uh, because we've been reading through Genesis right now, uh, the kind of assigned text today relates really well to what we're doing here with Confirmation Sunday as well. So I will read from Genesis 32, starting at verse 22 in just a moment. You certainly are free to follow along. Um, and I'll also reference uh, one other passage in Genesis 32 in a moment. Uh, it's this moment of, of Jacob wrestling with God. Uh, it's a pivotal moment in the Old Testament. It's one that we're not going to be able to spend a lot of time on this morning, but I think we can do something really useful uh, that will matter to us this morning. And I pray that as we hear the word of the Lord, that it would in fact sink in deeply to us this morning. Um, uh, let me preface this by saying what I thought of when I first uh, was thinking about preaching on this passage uh, was when I worked uh, in college ministry. I was working at Covenant Bible College in northern Colorado. It was a small school of 44 students, 22 men, 22 women. I, was kind of, I lived in the dorm with the, the men. And uh, the second year I did this, I did it for two years. The second year, we had an awful lot of emergency room visits. And of course, they never happen at a convenient time when you have to take somebody in. Uh, it's not four in the afternoon, it's four in the morning, right? And so uh, one night, uh, I was kind of the only adult around that particular night uh, that was on duty. And um, one of our women, young women, needed to go to the emergency room, quite obvious, needed to go. And three of her friends said, we'll go too for moral support. So we hopped in the van and uh, went into to Fort Collins and went to the emergency room and spent hours uh, there. And uh, so while I was gone, though, and that's a whole story in itself, which I won't tell you right now, but while I was gone, you know, this is one in the morning, something like that, apparently all the guys in the dorm could not sleep that night, um, and so they got a bunch of mattresses out and put them out in the main room and had WrestleMania out there that night while I was gone. <laughs> And when I came back at whatever time it was, four or five in the morning with the students, they went back to bed and uh, I went to bed and all that was left was the memory of that night, the legend of WrestleMania and the emergency room visit. And there's something about this story that is remarkable like that. There's this, this aura about this story because there's so much that happens in it when Jacob wrestles with God. So let's hear the text and let's just say a couple things about it from Genesis 32 starting at verse 22. It says, that night Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed the fort of the Yabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun ro rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. For many of us, you've been reading through the book of Genesis. We're about to launch into Exodus soon. And as you've read Genesis, as you get into Exodus, and as you keep going through the Old Testament, you encounter this title for God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it's, it's a marker. It's a title that points back to the covenant-making God. God's the one who made a promise with Abraham that's fulfilled through Isaac, that's fulfilled through Jacob and the family line. God's going to be faithful and keep 
that promise. And I'm thankful for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because just as we've heard in the, the variants of testimonies from our confirmation students, we get people like this in scripture that we can resonate with too. Abraham kind of comes out of nowhere in the story, it seems like, not really focused on God whatsoever, and he kind of stumbles his way and fumbles his way into the covenant. And he's, he's sold in by the end. He's, he's totally on board by the end of his life. Isaac, his son, who's going to be, uh, the, you know, the covenant's going to be fulfilled through that family line. Isaac is given uh, by a promise from God. And Isaac, if you read his story, we almost forget about the guy sometimes, I think, in the, the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because it doesn't seem as, as revolutionary as Abraham. And then you get to Jacob, and that overshadows everything that Isaac never did. Um, Isaac has this generally faithful life. He does commit the sin of his father at one point. But generally speaking, the crises come to him more than he creates them. And then you get to Jacob, and it's the opposite. Like He creates the drama wherever the man goes. Like the, He's a deceiver from birth. It's built into his name. And he is often, not always, but often the cause of his own misery. I mean, it comes to him, too. He gets deceived right and left as well. But he, he's taking what he dishes out, basically, uh, at many turns. And, and what you see in the story of Jacob particularly, you'll see these bookends sometimes in the text uh, where Jacob will, will lay down at one point when he's on the run, and, and that's when God comes to him. He makes this rock his pillow, and then he uses that as a monument the next day to call it Beth El because God came to him. That's house of God. God came to him and said, the promise is going to be fulfilled in you. Even though you're running, even though you're not sure about it yet, even though you haven't fully bought into it yet, the promise is going to be fulfilled. I made the promise to Abraham and to Isaac. You're part of that. And Jacob has caused his own problems up until this point, deceiving his brother Esau on a couple of occasions, running away from his, brother's, from his brother. And then he's deceived when he gets uh, married um, by his father-in-law, Laban. And he's deceived numerous times. And so he's run away from one set of troubles and then causes a whole bunch of others and they're caused to him as well. And then he causes some more troubles and then he runs away. Now he's got great abundance from his life on the run, decades away from his brother Esau, but now he has to run from that life back. And he goes back to make amends with Esau. And you can see the genius of Jacob the deceiver at work when he comes back to meet with Esau. If, for those of you that read the text this week, it's, it's a remarkable scene just before this wrestling match occurs. Esau sends mess, or Jacob sends messengers to his brother Esau, his older brother. And Esau comes with 400 men, and Jacob is afraid. Because it doesn't appear that those 400 men are coming with peace in mind, in his opinion. They're coming to get him. He says as much in the text. He doesn't know it, but he says it. It's written in there numerous times. He's living out of fear at this point. Esau is mad. Jacob is strategic in how he approaches it because he's always had to do things on his own. He's chosen that. And, and if you read the story, he sends five different flocks of animals to his brother Esau in what is just a genius bit of strategy on his part. Because if they're going to get him, if they're angry and they're going to kind of come at him with this force, he sends one group with uh, a couple hundred sheep. And they say, Jacob is coming. And he says, but now the next group, wait until they get there before you send the next group. And he keeps sending these five different flocks. So you can kind of read in the text that, that by the time that these different flocks would have come, you'd have a military force that's standing there ready to attack each time, kind of like standing down. Stand up, stand down. Stand. Is he ever going to come? Where is this Jacob going to come? He's, he's throwing them off. He's also sending them not a small amount of livestock, but a massive amount of livestock, basically saying, Esau, I'm no threat to you. I have everything I need. I'm not trying to take anything from you. And if you were going to pay anybody who was going to get me, guess what? I'm giving you all I have. There's nothing to take. I'm giving it to you. And besides that, if you think of the practicality of the matter, imagine now you've got 400 men who have at least that many sheep, goats, and donkeys. To travel with that many sheep, goat, and donkeys takes some work. And they make noise. It's a very smart move on Jacob's part. He's always looked out for himself. He's doing that in this particular case. He's smart. He's always relied on on his brains and his level of deceit that he can do. And that's, that's the eve of, of this wrestling match. He sends all of that stuff. But what's interesting, in, in Genesis 32, 9, there's a very telling prayer from Jacob. 
before, when he's just about to send all this stuff, it says, Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. And the question before us as you read through the story and as you see him wrestle with God is, at what point will God become the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob too? At what point will he take ownership of this promise, of this God who's reached out to him over and over and said the promise is going to be fulfilled in you? He hasn't yet done that. When will Jacob stop deceiving himself and yield to God and God's ways? That's what we're confronted with in the text. That's what's happening in the wrestling match. So he goes to this place that he'll eventually name Peniel because it means uh, a face of God or I saw God face to face, he says, and he lived. And, and there's a word play in the text. I don't really do Hebrew, but, but from what I read, it's there that Jacob, Jacob, crosses the Yabak River and Havox with God. It sounds all similar, wrestles with God. He's really wrestling himself is what the word play is telling us as much as he's wrestling God in the process. He's got to yield and give up himself to God's plan and God's will. And by this point, Jacob is old, quite old in his life when he's wrestling with God. And so as you read it, it looks like it's a physical matchup. He, he can't, God can't overpower him physically, but obviously God can because he touches the socket of his hip and he's limping. Obviously, it's not just a physical thing that's the matter. This is a spiritual matter. This is decades of self -defi or defiance and self-will and action and the call on Jacob, are you going to give that up to yield to me? To yield to God? And so what does God do in the whole thing? He's, he's not overpowering him because he needs Jacob to yield. God can't force that. That's got to be a decision Jacob makes. And it takes him all night to get there. And finally, it's the blessing that does it. Bless me. And God changes his name in the process. Now, Old Testament names, sometimes in our culture, names can mean something. Sometimes they don't. I don't know if you go around asking people what their name means. I do it a lot um, and because I'm always curious. And some people know, some people don't. Old Testament world, they knew. They knew what their name meant. They knew probably why they had it. It marked something. It said something aspirational about who they were. In this case, it's kind of like uh, planting a flag when you climb a mountain, right? This belongs to the U.S. when you put it at the top, right? We claim this land. That's what's going on. There's a, a marker being made when God renames him Israel. He says, you're becoming a new identity now. You're becoming something else. You're mine. You've struggled with me, and you're going to continue to struggle with me. And many of us are wrestlers with God. I don't know if you're, you're a wrestler with God in the house, but we should be thankful for Jacob. God says, I'm still with you. I'm still contending with you, but yield. Come with me. The blessing is ahead. The promise is ahead. Jacob then tries to gain power over God. Hey, tell me your name. Because in the Old Testament, that's also how you could gain power over someone. And God says, that's not going to happen. Let's just work on you right now. Jacob is marked with a new beginning. Jacob is marked, and he marks the place, Peniel. You see these, this place naming goes on throughout Genesis, um, and Jacob's one of the ones who does it the most. He, he says, here's something important that happened in this place. I need to remember this night. Something changed in me. And brothers and sisters, we need Bethels and Peniels. We need those rituals, those rites, those moments, those markers in our life. Just like hiking a trail, you see the mile marker. We need to see those mile markers in our own life, in our walk towards God and with God and into the promises and blessings that God has for us. What's brilliant is confirmation is one of those markers that we have within the church. We have all kinds of them, right? Uh, but the question that, that comes before us with confirmation is, do you own the faith? Are you going to take one step further into this thing that the church proclaims and that we've raised you in? Is this something that you can begin to own one step further? And it's not just a confirmation question. This is a question for all of us. Jacob, the question of Jacob yielding to God and giving in to God is for all of us. We have all kinds of markers within church life, whether it's births and dedications, baptisms, weddings, funerals, confirmation like we're doing today, membership, healing, salvation. Any of those things mark our, our pennials and Bethels along the way where God reaches in and says, are you with me? Am I your God? Just like Jacob needs to con confront, is this the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
and Jacob. Is this my God or not? Am I claiming that? We have to ask the same question. Am I still going to follow God but try and retain some control? Am I going to follow God and follow his suggestions from time to time so I can get some of the blessing but conveniently ignore it when I want to do my own will? Is that how we're going to conduct ourselves? That's what Jacob is asking of us when we read this. Or am I called and gifted by God? Are you called and gifted by God to be part of the promise of salvation, of the new heaven and the new earth, of the hope of standing in glory with God someday and even getting a foretaste of that now in this life? Is that what we are? And are we living with the people of the promise, with all the blessing that God gives us? Have you got a new name with Jesus Christ? Have you, do you have a new identity? Is your mind being transformed and renewed into his image? Are you conforming to the pattern of this world or the one to come? Those are the questions of Jacob. Have you yielded so that you're being conformed into the image of Christ? Jacob had to give himself to God in order for the promises to work out in his life. To be a part of that. Yes, it was the God of Abraham and Isaac. But was Jacob going to take hold too? And the same question confronts us. It's true for Jacob. It's true for us. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But is God the God of you and me? Have we taken hold of this faith today? I want to pray. And then I'm going to invite our confirmation students up uh, for the, the rite of confirmation. Father, I thank you that we get to, to be your people. I thank you that you've called us and you've gifted us. Uh, to action in your kingdom, that you've called and gifted us to share the good news that we've experienced in our own lives. And for those of us who haven't experienced that good news, Father, or today, if it doesn't feel like good news, will you please wrestle with us a little bit? Can we contend with you today so that we can set up a pennial tomorrow? So that we can put a monument up and say, God, we know you're there. We know you're wrestling with us, and we know you're calling something deeper out of us. But you're calling us to choose that. You're calling us to give up what was to become what is. To give up the false promises of life without you for the promises and blessings of life with you in your kingdom to come. Father, help us live that reality of your kingdom even today. Like wheat growing in the midst of weeds. May you be nourished and nurtured by your word and your presence. We pray this in your name. Amen.